David Williams is here with me in Studio Q. Welcome. Thank you very much. What a fantastic introduction. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so let's let's give people a little bit of background on the story. Um, it, it ultimately comes down to a relationship between two people, between a boy named Jack and his grandfather. What's going on uh, that kicks off the adventure? For them? Well, his grandpa is losing his memory, and he thinks he's back in World War II, where he was a Royal Air Force uh, pilot flying a Spitfire, uh, which is a magnificent fighter plane that's kind of legendary in Britain and I felt like when someone enters that kind of imaginary world it's a lot like playing mm. and children like to play and I thought I thought maybe everyone would be would be um, would find this condition really tough to deal with apart from a child who may understand it and just enter this world with him. And so together they go on this incredible adventure. The, the grandpa is sent to an old folks home. And then I basically play out one of my favorite movies, which is The Great Escape in an old folks home, which was an idea I'd had for a while and really wanted to do. And it ends up with them going into the Imperial War Museum in London, where they have fighter planes hanging from the ceiling. And their plan is to steal a plane and take it to the air. Uh, okay, so this is for kids aged 8 to 12. That's right. What do you want kids to understand about dementia and about growing old? Well, lots of parents have said thanks for the book because because their child has a uh, has a grandparent with dementia. I suppose I just wanted to tackle a serious subject in a way that was safe for kids. And um, I'm trying to engage kids with their grandparents' past as well. Because I think when you're a kid, old people seem impossibly old. Mm -hmm. It's probably the way you're looking at me now. Um, <laughs> and 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 you could forget that they've had actually a really fascinating life. And and for for my generation, my grandparents uh, were all alive during the Second World War. They were all adults. They all had their parts to play in various ways. My real grandpa was uh, in the Royal Air Force, and and so it's also about engaging with old people and 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 listening to their stories. Why is that important to you? Because you've written another book before about a, an adventure mm. across generations like this. Why, why is that important for you? Well, because I think I think otherwise these stories get lost. And a lot of them are, uh, you know, personal stories. It's not all just history, is it? As in, you know, history in a textbook. Mm -hmm. Some of it is is oral history, isn't it? My, my, grandfather, my grandmother, for example, uh, lived in London during the Blitz and the Second World War. And she had incredible stories about bombs dropping and them hide, hiding in the underground system and people she knew dying and it, and it, and you know she I, I thought age you know 11 that she was a bit boring and uh, she just liked playing Scrabble and I kind of didn't look forward to spending time with her that much until I asked her about her incredible past. Do you remember how old you were when you started to investigate that stuff? I think her? about 10 or 11. Okay. I think you got quite selfish as a child and sometimes quite disinterested in everyone else because you're kind of used actually to the world revolving around you. Um, so so for me, it's about about hearing these stories. And you know, everyone in every family have got fascinating stories. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be about the Second World War. It could be about anything. And uh, it's just really important, I think, to listen and engage and learn. Was that and pivotal? Learn to... from the mistakes of the past. You know, yeah. we see, don't we, in the world all the time, you know, things coming around again. You think, oh, surely yeah. we can learn from what happened before. But some, somehow people don't. Somehow we do not. Mm. Yeah. Um, do you think kids are sometimes better at understanding what's going on than we give them credit for? Definitely. I think they're really, really intuitive. And, um, and yeah, they, they pick up on emotional things a lot, I think. Um, so yeah, and I think I, I think they're a lot cleverer than people give credit to, you know. Mm. And the thing is, people think, oh, you're writing a children's book, therefore, you know, you won't be able to deal with a, a difficult theme. Um, but actually, children are really ready to um, to try and engage with those kind of things. It's interesting. I think some kids are blissfully unaware. You know, my mom always tells me about how she grew up and she went through some very difficult things on the other side of the world, but she was blissfully unaware and she had a very happy childhood. And other kids are very aware. They're very sensitive. What side were you on uh, as a kid? Um, I think I was quite sensitive, but also I was quite wrapped up in my own imaginary world, which is probably why I ended up being a, a writer because I actually liked spending time on my own and used to practice like comedy sketches in the bathroom mirror and listen to Monty Python records all day and write down all the lines 
and uh, and then act out the sketches in school. So so yeah, I think I was I think I was pretty sensitive to what was going on, but at the same time quite happy to go away and yeah, <laughs> and be in my imaginary world. Yeah. And I and I really like the imaginary world. So uh, this book deals a lot with dementia. Mm. Not an easy topic to bring humor to. Um, mm. How did you manage to do that? Well, I feel, I mean, you mentioned Roald Dahl in the introduction. I think he really uh, is a great example to all writers, whether they're children's writers or not, because he manages to combine humor with quite dark themes often. And and sometimes his books are really actually terrifying. And the start of The Witches, he says the, the witches kill children. You go, whoa! Uh, you know, he doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't hold back. Um, so I think learning from his example, you, you know, you can take on something serious and, and, and still make it funny. And in, in, in my mind, the funny and the tragic are are so closely linked and sometimes they're totally simultaneous. Hmm. The same thing can be can be b- both those things. Um, I think people often think, well, humor can only deal with certain topics and uh, and and you know serious subjects can't be touched by it. But actually humor shines a light on on serious topics really well. Do you remember the feeling of reading Roald Dahl books when you were a kid and reading a line like that, the, the witches, you know, do what mm. they do? Do you remember the sensation? I, for you I remember you exactly going into the library and finding Charlie in the Chocolate Factory because my parents would take me and my sister to the library every couple of weeks and we pick books. And I wasn't a voracious reader. And I probably was drawn to more books, you know, like a book about space travel, something not not necessarily stories. And then I found this book that I loved, and it's so imaginative, and I reread it again and again and again. And it was this wonderful thing where I felt like I was the only person in the world who knew it, and I discovered it. And also, it's a very personal relationship, the author to the reader. So you feel like they're talking directly to you, and you're part of this little secret club with them. And it's a, it's a really magical feeling when you find a book that you love. Uh, another uh, important theme in this book is, is both Jack and his grandpa question authority. Mm. parents, teachers, museum guards. Mm. Why is that important to you? I think it's really important because, um, in fact, right at the end of the book, um, all the old folk end up attacking the local vicar (laughs) because the local vicar turns out to have a rather evil double life. Um, I think it's important because... Otherwise, we blindly accept authority without challenging it. And that's that's a bad thing, isn't it? Whether it's, mm. you know, I mean, we're getting serious now, whether it's racist cops in America or, uh, you know, Catholic priests, um, you know, abusing children or whatever. I mean, it's like if we blindly accept authority that anyone in a uniform or, you know, uh, yeah. is 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 can't be challenged it's it's a really bad state of affairs were you uh, a kid that challenged authority or is that uh, is this like a fantasy uh, for uh, you being that i kid think i did i think most comics do because they're used to going into school and making fun of the teachers and gets them into trouble a bit but at the same time they really enjoy uh you know making their classmates laugh so i think i was quite anti-authoritarian and I, yeah i didn't really accept things like quite from quite an early age I thought of thought I will I couldn't believe in religion and I thought I, I and so and so yeah I didn't I think I didn't blindly follow um everything I was told and it's gotten you to where you are today well <laughs> is that good um no well I think it's important isn't it it's yeah. important I mean it, yeah. to respect authority sometimes but but it's good to challenge it and question it's, it's it. not infallible no yeah I'm uh, not the Sex Pistols, but <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important. So uh, similarly, I brought up Roald Dahl. You brought mm. up uh, Roald Dahl. Uh, similarly, you both have this uh, irreverence of authority. You both have this kind of uh, gruesome sense of humor. Um, how do you how do you achieve that? Is it like walking a line? Is it something deliberate, or you just have that sensibility in terms of walking that line between just naughty enough? Uh, for a young audience, it's hard because I remember when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was watch adult comedy shows that were too rude for me, watch films with an 18 certificate that were not meant for me. Um, And so I think it's really important if you're writing for children not to talk down to them. They really want something that is 
a little bit dangerous. I think the best children's books, you, you think of reading them under the duvet with a torch. And if your parents came in, say, why are you reading that? So It's just a little bit ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, lots of children like Little Britain, this comedy sketch show that I did with Matt Lucas. And, and I thought if I could capture the spirit of that um, without the rudest parts, um, I'm sure there's a big audience of children that would really like that. Mm -hmm. And so and so that's what I was trying to do, really. Um, I think you know the boundaries because you know you're not going to want out swearing in a children's book. You're not going to want sexual references. There's lots of things you're not going to do. But at the same time, the book must feel a bit forbidden. I think most of the great children's books do. Have that little bit of intrigue that comes from that. As you said, Little Britain wasn't specifically aimed at kids, but we know they were watching it because mm. their teachers complained. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there, was a, there was a survey in 2009 and some blamed the show for their naughty behavior. What did you think uh, when you heard that? Yeah, well, I've happened. That's the first time I've heard that. Oh, really? Well, I, specifically, I was blamed. Um, well, that's hard, isn't it? I mean, you put something out there, you don't necessarily know exactly what response people are going to have to it. Uh, it was not our aim to corrupt um, the <laughs> children of, of Britain or Canada. Um, but, um, but no, I think kids liked it because it was larger than life and it was almost like cartoon characters mm -hmm. come to life. But I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I loved The Young Ones, which was a, I don't know if that's known here. I loved Monty Python. I loved Not Nine O'Clock News. I loved Blackadder. I loved all the shows that were not meant for you if you were 11 or 12 years old. And so it's probably exactly the same now with all kids wanting to watch The Inbetweeners and the, the you know, the, the ruder comedies. Do you think there's something uh, shared between a kid's sense of humor and adult sense of humor? Like, I always notice uh, 11 or 12-year-olds that have a great grasp of absurdity, almost better than adults sometimes. They just find so much absurd. Uh, in yeah, the I, think, I, think, I, think, I think you're right. I think definitely most kids could probably enjoy a lot of Monty Python because it's so visual and, and silly. I suppose the thing that leaves you cold as a kid is satire, political satire. You're never going to really get into that unless you're really well-informed. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I love... Um, entertaining crowds and and more and more it's a very mixed crowd of people like today uh, I'll be at the Toronto library later and I imagine it will be you know mums and dads with kids and I want to make them all laugh and I don't really make a big distinction of like well this is a joke only um for the kids or the adults although I do often make one joke sometimes the question comes up what's the your favorite book that you've ever written and sometimes I say Fifty Shades of Grey, which is... <laughs> that might be over their heads. Yeah, yeah, which is a joke for the mums and dads. <laughs> uh, just to give people an idea of how much kids love your books uh, in the UK, just the other day you were posting pictures on social media of kids dressed up as your characters. Mm. What was going on there? Well, we have this this thing in, in the UK called World Book Day. We say it's World Book Day. It seems it's only in the UK. But... Um, Basically, kids go to school dressed as a, as their favorite character from a book. can be any book. But the great thing is lots of kids went as characters from my books, including Grandpa, uh, from Grandpa's Great Escape, even with their own Spitfire planes made oh. out of papier-mâché. And the wonderful thing about social media, it's so immediate, the mums and dads send you the pictures and they're, you know, they're... They like getting retweeted or, um, you know, the, yeah. you press the favorite button. Uh, and it's really, really joyous. And especially how quick a character becomes well known because, you know, this book only came out in September and already people are dressing up as the characters from it. So it's it's a real thrill for me. And kids live with books. They don't just kind of read it and put it aside. A lot of times they spend a lot of time with it. Yeah, I mean, some kids will read the book in a day and they'll tweet me at the end of the day it comes out and say, when's the next one out? And other kids will read maybe a chapter a night and it will take them a, a couple of months. Uh, you have some detractors too. Tell me about oh, the letter good. of complaints you get from kids. Uh, well, kids are a tough audience and if they don't like something they'll let you know and I had a brilliant letter um, from a little girl complaining about the TV version of Billionaire Boy which is one of my books and she was basically saying it wasn't as good as, as the book and why did I change elements of it and you know it was long you know it was a couple of pages and it was a massive <laughs> takedown but I kind of loved it because it was really honest and I and I I, I I wrote back to her and I and I actually tweeted the, the picture of it. And then sometimes kids complain about something you might do in the book, like starting sentences with "and" that they probably learned in their in their class that you're not meant to do. 
But sometimes, you know, as a, as a writer, you want to take license with grammatical rules, you know, to to bring mm -hmm. the story to life. So um, yeah, the grammar trolls—they're everywhere. I guess. Yeah, even I know. And on Twitter, so you've got to be careful. But um, I like that, and it's great that kids are confident enough to engage with you about those things. And one time, one of the books was published, and just as a mistake, there were like two chapters, both called like chapter twenty. I literally, it was like hundreds and hundreds of books. Uh, sorry, hundreds and hundreds letters. of letters from kids pointing out the mistake, really gleefully. Well, in a sense, you're doing your job well then, because we talked about questioning authority being a theme in uh, these mm. books. And so I guess yeah, if they have no. the confidence to speak their mind to an adult, it's that's good. A, that's a good thing. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you very much.